Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining Front Office Sports. I'm Lisa Granitstein, FOS Chief Content Officer. As the world's attention turns to soccer this weekend for the official start of the World Cup, we're psyched to be hosting an all-star lineup of football pros and analysts, some of whom are calling in live from Qatar. Be sure to get in on the conversation and hit them up with questions in the chat. And a special thank you to our sponsor, Globin, the global platform supporter of FIFA Plus, which is helping organizations lead through digital and cognitive transformation. So let's get into it. Please welcome front office sports writer, Doug Greenberg, who will introduce the first session. All right, thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Doug Greenberg. I'm a writer here at Front Office Sports. Um, today for our first conversation, we are sitting down with Grant Wall, who is coming to us live from Qatar to cover his 13th World Cup. Uh, Grant is one of the world's leading soccer journalists. He writes for grantwall.com, hosts the football, that's F-U-T-B-O-L, the Spanish spelling, with Grant Wall podcast, Football with Grant Wall. And he does television work for CBS Sports and produces documentary films. Grant, welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, great to be with you. Glad we got a good internet connection here in Qatar. So uh, just psyched to have a good conversation. Amazing. Great. Well, yeah, I mean, that's definitely one of the, uh, the good things that we can start off with with Qatar. Um, and let's just start with the basics. You know, besides the internet connection, how is it over there? Really hot. Uh, you know, this tournament, the World Cup usually takes place in June and July, and they moved it to November, December because it's so hot in Qatar in the summer. But it's actually still really hot here in November. It's been in the 90s all week during the day, and the U.S. team has been training, and they're going through it, you know, just dealing with the elements. Uh, I guess it's fortunate for them that all their games are kicking off at 10 p.m. local time, 2 p.m. Eastern time in the group stage. So it'll be cooler at night, uh, which is a good thing. But uh, I got here on Monday and a lot of people are arriving every day. So you're getting more traffic here in Doha. It's an unusual World Cup in the sense that it's all in one city and we're not used to something like that. Uh, there's lots of issues, obviously, with Qatar hosting the World Cup, but from a purely logistics perspective, it's very easy to cover compared to most. I can sleep in the same bed every night. I don't need to jump on planes. And when I don't have to do that sort of stuff, I can spend more time doing my work and, and enjoying covering the World Cup. Yeah, well, and there you go. That right off the bat, there are some some differences you've noticed right off the bat. Um, you know, the and, and that's really interesting, too, that you mentioned some of those logistics, the fact that it's all in the same place. Um, you know, what are kind of from your experience of covering World Cups, what are some of those logistics, you know, besides maybe having to hop on planes when things are not in the same city, stuff like that, um, and, and just any other logistics that come with, with covering a World Cup or running a World Cup um, that maybe our audience doesn't know about? I mean, this is the biggest sporting event in the world. You know, it's, it's bigger than the Olympics in terms of the number of people who watch it. It's once every four years. And unlike the Olympics, you know, it's, it's twice as long as the Olympics. And so I'm here for five weeks. I'll be here for the entire tournament. I'll be covering the US team every day for my site, um, as long as they're in the tournament. And then once they're out, I'm assuming they won't get to the final, but we'll see. Uh, then I'll start following other stories of what's happening in the World Cup. But, um, you know, because this is my 13th World Cup, my eighth men's, uh, I've learned a lot of stuff over the years just about sort of what's important and to cover and, and just as importantly, what I don't need to do here because I could be up 24 hours a day doing work if I wanted to, but you can't function that way. And it's easy to get sick. It's easy, um, it, that's pre-COVID, but also now that we have COVID, I have people coming in from all over the world. So I just try and make sure I get sleep like at least six hours a night if possible, that I have at least one good meal a day. And I also just need to watch all the games so that I can talk about what's happening in the tournament with some authority. You literally have to put in the time and there's going to be four games a day starting uh, Tuesday. So that's eight hours just in the day watching soccer, which is 
a lot of fun, obviously, but you know, I'm writing off of those things and need to be able to be on top of stuff. So logistically, I just keep a really tight calendar on what I'm doing, what I've agreed to do, and, and just as importantly, what I've decided not to do. I was going to go to the opening game and attend on Sunday between Qatar and Ecuador, and I canceled my stadium seat today because the U.S. coach is having a press conference the night before the U.S.'s first game. And for me, that's a higher priority. Yeah, no, it, may, it completely makes sense. You know, um, wish I could uh, be on the ground watching some soccer all day long, too, is my job. But I'll just have to settle from doing it from here. Um, you know, what's uh, right off the bat, you know, what is already looking? You, you've kind of addressed some of the stuff already, but what else is looking to be different about covering this specific World Cup in Qatar um, than other World Cups that you've covered in the past? I mean, it's an authoritarian country. I've covered World Cups in authoritarian countries before in Russia in 2018. Um, and it's there's a lot of complex issues, right? Issues which I've covered uh, from my side. I came to Qatar in February for a week and uh, and all I did was talk to migrant workers. I went to 14 FIFA hotels here, including the, the hotel where the U.S. team is staying. And I asked workers at each hotel and gave them anonymity and, and asked them, in their experience, are the new laws to protect workers that were passed by the Qatari government in 2019, are they being followed on the ground? And some trends emerge the more people I talk to, which is that, no, they are not being followed, all of them on the ground. Some of them are, like the minimum wage is being followed and people are generally getting paid. That minimum wage is $1.25 an hour in the richest country in, in the world per capita. Um, and then there's other things that aren't happening. So you're, if you're a worker from East Africa or West Africa or the Indian subcontinent or Southeast Asia, you're supposed to be able to choose to change jobs uh, in country uh, without your employer getting in the way. And a bunch of people I talked to said they could not do that. Some told me their employer had their passport, which is totally illegal and prevents them from having freedom of movement. Uh, some told me that they had to pay large recruitment fees just to get to Qatar so they could earn money and send it home. But that meant they arrived in debt and recruitment fees are supposed to be illegal as well. So there's lots of stuff that's like, there has been progress in the last 10 years since Qatar got the World Cup, but there's a lot more progress that needs to happen in terms of enforcement of these laws on the ground. So that's a trend I've noticed that applies to a lot of things here of like, there may be rules, uh, that may be attempting to be a bit more progressive, but they're not necessarily followed on the ground. So yesterday I was literally getting my accreditation at the media center and was in line, took a, a photograph of the, the slogan on the wall and the security guard literally walked over and told me I could not take a picture, even though there's no signs saying I couldn't do it. And I needed to kindly delete the photo from my camera, a photo of, the slogan on the wall. And so clearly they're not supposed to be doing that. And yet the culture here of security guards um, is such security forces is such that I think there's a real concern about how um, protesters might be treated, whether they're fans or even players, uh, what might happen if people are wearing a rainbow flag. So the rules are that they've said that we're not going to, you know, detain anybody who's wearing a rainbow flag in a country where same-sex relationships are illegal, by the way. Um, but there might be incidents. And are there going to be situations between security people and fans from around the world um, that escalate when they should? Yeah. And, you know, that's a really interesting point, because I saw this morning you actually um, put up a story. Uh, I saw this on Twitter. Um, you put up a story about the security guidelines um, that the the security at the World Cup are going to have to take uh, as it pertains to, you know, LGBT fans, uh, drunk fans, all that kind of thing. Um, you know, and I guess we'll see what happens when the rubber meets the road. But do you kind of see them, you know, basically for, for anyone who hasn't seen it, um, it 
basically said, we're not going to be detaining these people, blah, 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 that kind of thing. Um, but once the rubber hits the road, do you think that these guidelines are going to be followed, you know, as it pertains to uh, LGBT and, and even drunk people and women and, and, and all these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think realistically, we're going to see some incidents. And I guess the question is how many and how, how bad are they going to be? Um, yeah, I certainly wasn't the only journalist who dealt with stuff yesterday. There was a Danish camera crew doing a live hit in Doha in a place where they it's a public place and are, they're totally allowed to do the live hit. And they were interrupted by Qatari security people who shut it down and threatened to break their camera. So um, it's a weird situation when you have an, a, an international tournament of this is the big one, right? And, and they're supposed to be welcoming you. And that's some of the stuff that's happening here. I hope we don't see more, but yeah, we will see. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, a lot of this falls on the Qatari government. Um, you, you know, they've, they're doing what they can to put on this tournament. Right. And obviously FIFA has a little bit of responsibility with this, with all of this as well. Um, you know, just what, what kind of, you know, what kind of responsibility does FIFA hold uh, in, in this whole scenario? I mean, FIFA was the organization that granted the hosting rights to Qatar back in 2010 uh, to a lot of controversy from the moment it happened. And, and originally, most of the controversy, because Qatar beat out the U.S. to host this World Cup, was, oh, Qatar bought this um, and bribed officials. And actually, that did happen, according to uh, the U.S. Department of Justice investigation that made so many arrests in 2015. So that happened as well with Russia, which got the World Cup for 2018 the same day. I mean, as you probably know, it happened with Salt Lake City and the Olympics. So the culture of FIFA and the IOC is such that it's this weird gift-giving culture I've, I've noticed over the years. And they may have toned it down a little bit, but it still exists. And so that was a lot of the coverage at first. And then pretty quickly, the coverage of Qatar and the World Cup uh, changed into discussion of migrant workers and their treatment of micro migrant workers here, women's rights, LGBTQ rights. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, some changes have been made. But, you know, FIFA, these were 24 men, all men on the executive committee in 2010, who were a cast of shady and corrupt characters, uh, many of whom have gone to jail, had been part of the U.S. indictment. Uh, so, you know, FIFA was a totally dirty organization then, may still be now. Um, you know, that's another discussion. Um, but that all that led to, to Qatar getting this World Cup. Yeah, I mean, in theory, the fact that they ousted that previous regime in FIFA, you know, they, they'd like to think that it maybe it solved all their problems, but maybe it didn't solve all of them. Um, they're working towards it, but... You know what? At the end of the day, uh, there is going to be a soccer tournament played. You know, the the, the soccer tournament that everybody looks forward to uh, all four, you know, every four years. Um, you know, what are you kind of seeing from a like, let's just kind of do a quick and dirty preview of from a soccer perspective. What's going to what you're looking for in this tournament? You know, who's looking like the strong teams? Um, yeah, let's weak teams, strong teams who maybe will surprise from a uh underdog standpoint who might disappoint you know anything you want to go with off of that yeah i mean for the u.s it's really important just to be back in the world cup which it missed out on in 2018 which was literally the biggest failure in the history of u.s soccer so the u.s has the youngest team in the tournament with some exciting players playing for some of the biggest clubs in europe and so there's a real sense of positivity around this u.s program that they now need to back up on the field in a tough group. Uh, England is the second game the day after Thanksgiving. They're going to open against Wales on Monday, and they finish up with Iran, which has a whole history on and off the field with the U.S. And, you know, all of those teams are, are pretty good teams. England's a candidate to win the entire tournament, but it will be a disappointment if the U.S. does not advance from the group. On paper, they should. 
but they're also young and they have a lot of variability in their performances from really good to really disappointing. Um, the defending champion is France, and there's a, a crazy stat in the Men's World Cup. Four of the last five World Cup winners in the subsequent World Cup went out in the group stage, which is almost starting to get to be a somewhat large sample size at this point. You know, Germany was a defending champion in 2018. They finished last in their group. And I think there is a sense that when you win a World Cup, Usually the coach remains and probably sticks around too long and sticks with some of his players too long and they're generally too old. Um, and so I'm curious to see what happens with France, the defending champion. And I think they could have trouble here. They have an immense amount of talent. They're capable of winning it again. But uh, France has a history of either doing very well at World Cups or imploding totally. And I think there's a, a chance for that type of implosion. And they've had a lot of injuries heading into this tournament. Uh, my pick to win it is Argentina. Uh, Lionel Messi is, in my opinion, already the greatest player of all time. But for a lot of people, he needs to win at least one World Cup to actually deserve to be called that. And this is his last chance, as it is for Cristiano Ronaldo. And they're the two top players of their generation, uh, stayed on top for more than a decade. And they're still very, very good. Messi's in great form has a good team around him now, which he hasn't always with Argentina. And they've gone 34 games without a loss, Argentina, heading into the tournament. So um, I've got them beating Belgium in the final um, after uh, Argentina beats Brazil in the semis. And uh, Belgium's a team that got to the semis four years ago. And I think they still have enough talent and good coaching uh, to make a, a deep run in this tournament and a favorable bracket. So... Um, those are some of them. I think a dark horse would be Denmark. Um, I could see them going deep. I've got them going to the semifinals. They're a small country and they don't have a superstar, but they have the best story also of the tournament, which is Christian Eriksen, um, who literally went into cardiac arrest on the field during the euros in 2021. And there were fears that he was going to lose his life. He uh, survived, has come back, is playing for Manchester United. And that Denmark team is just such a good team in how they perform. And they've gotten great results in qualifying. And I think they can make a deep run here. Yeah, those, those are all really fascinating picks. Denmark, you know, as you said, they are an unbelievable story. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say I really like your final prediction. Uh, I actually am very high on Belgium as a better as a better, nice. because everybody everybody knows I have a betting background, or some people know that. Um, I, Bel Belgium's odds are way, way down. Um, and I think that, I mean, they have the best midfielder in the world in Kevin De Bruyne. Um, you know, uh, so, and, that, and that's a team that's always been kind of that, everyone's always hype about them, but they never quite get it done, that kind of thing. But, you know, and then on the other side, Argentina, had a chance in the final. I always thought that was going to be their best chance ever to win it um, when, the, when they played Germany in that final, um, which I believe, I believe I'm thinking of the right year. Um, so, you know, definitely fascinating storylines with, with both of those. Um, yeah. I, I'm just thinking what else we want to do before maybe we get into some uh, audience questions, by all means, uh, everybody in the chat. Uh, go ahead and throw some questions in. I'm going to start with one right here um, before we figure out if we want to talk about anything else. Um, we have uh, Carlos Chavez. He is asking, with everything being so close in proximity, uh, do you see that affecting these teams and have them, how they'll maybe play faster, maybe get some better rest, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I can remember the 2014 World Cup. The U.S. was based in Sao Paulo in Brazil, you know, very far south, and then drew games in the far northeast of Brazil and in the Amazon in Manaus. And they spent so much time on planes just to get to these locations that um, – there was just so much waste in terms of logistical stuff. And you're not going to be dealing with that here. So I think that's good for, uh, for all the teams that are staying here. I, like that said, countervailing forces have been that uh, ever since uh, COVID got slightly better and they started playing games again, organizers of soccer have made top players play way too many games. 
um, over the last couple of years. And so we've seen that lead to injuries. We've seen it lead to fatigue. We've seen it lead to not as high quality of play. And that sort of continued in the lead up to this World Cup. You know, typically it's in June. There's about a two to three week break from the end of the club season where players can get uh, better uh, from somewhat minor injuries and be ready to play in the World Cup. But the club season just paused a few days ago. Literally, there were club games going on on Sunday. And so there's very little turnaround time. And so if you had like an injury that you might have recovered from, from a pre for a previous World Cup, we're seeing a lot of players get injuries and they're out now. And, and that's really unfortunate, I think. But, um, you know, I, you hope for the best. I love the World Cup. It's my favorite event, sporting event in the world. There's going to be guaranteed amazing stories over the next couple of weeks, you know, five weeks. And, and I'm really excited about it. Yeah, well, and and uh, actually a question from the audience just got me thinking about it, too. And you talked about injuries, um, you know, the idea of these constructing these rosters, right? Um, some there are always some controversial decisions when it comes to building these rosters uh, from each separate team. Uh, Tony Miller in the chat, he's asking about specifically uh, Pepe not getting a call up. Um, you know, that's obviously a big one. But are there other besides just Pepe, are there other ones that maybe there were some some controversial roster decisions that you have some thoughts on. There were more surprises from the U S coach, Greg Burhalter and his final world cup roster than I was expecting. You know, he's a generally conservative guy that once you sort of get a sense of how he approaches things, he sort of has his guys and there hasn't been a lot of change during the qualifying process. And so he did uh, give us some surprises. I didn't think would happen. Zach Steffen, the goalkeeper who, started uh, almost half of the world cup qualifying games wasn't even brought to Qatar. He was left completely off the roster. He's not hurt. Um, I thought he was going to start during the world cup. I thought he was Burhalter's guy. So uh, that was the biggest surprise, but Ricardo Pepe, you mentioned not being called uh, to the world cup um, and very is a very promising forward who Burhalter had stuck with even when he wasn't scoring as many goals for club or country and he called him in in September, but he did not call him into the World Cup. And um, it's not that Pepe was some slam dunk uh, choice or, or would have even necessarily started at the World Cup, but I was slightly surprised that he wasn't on the roster at all. Yeah, I, th I thought that was a little strange as well. There were, Again, some questionable decisions. Stefan not getting the call, even if he hasn't been in good form, he hasn't been totally healthy, it's it was surprising for sure. Um, I, I guess we'll just, I'm going to go with one more audience question. Um, we talk a lot about this proximity and how everything's just all so close together. Um, how is that going to impact the public actually attending the games? Uh, this is a question from Camila Hammer. Um, you know, she said that maybe they'd heard a little bit of some logistical problems. Like, do you see any logistical problems coming out of that? I'm waiting to see how full the stadiums are because that's, the case with basically every world cup and you know like fifa has said a bunch of tickets have been sold and they always list you know which countries have bought more tickets for the world cup than others the u.s is always really high on the list by the way um and yet like i don't know for certain that every game is going to be sold out and my sense is there's a possibility that because the qataris would lose face if the stands aren't full that they would make sure the stands are full. Um, however, you know, whichever way they could, but uh, we'll see. I'm curious to see how many U S fans are at the U S games because uh, you know, there were a lot in Brazil in 2014, but uh, there is you know a real sense of, I think a lot of people are conflicted about this world cup being in Qatar. And, and um, I know from a fan perspective, the main, supporters group the american outlaws for u.s soccer like they're much dialed down from 2014 in brazil and, and they really aren't even being allowed by the qatari government to to host big events here so um it, it's an open-ended question i'm very curious about once the tournament starts on saturday or sunday sorry yeah um yeah well perfect thank you grant i, I think we're just about at the time here um Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you uh, to everybody out in the audience for asking questions. Sorry if we could, didn't have time to get to your questions. 
Um, but Grant, thank you so much for uh, for doing this and for giving us the the scene on the ground there in in Qatar. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. All right. Well, stick around, everybody. Um, our next session will start in just a few minutes, so stay tuned.